Yeah, good morning. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, no. Good morning. Um, this is, uh, it's a complex um, thing I'm talking about, and some of those, or many of those patients actually won't reach adulthood um, besides essentially specialized centers, but nevertheless, uh, those are the anomalies we'll see in the, we usually correct, colodocus cyst is maybe the most relevant, bilioteresia, and then some other rarer diseases, which often are treated in, in liver transplant centers later, but some of those patients actually may reach adulthood with just um, essentially the surgery they received in, as an infant. And I don't want to go over all the colodocal cysts, which is relevant. The most important, really, is the type 1, which has this big cyst on the outside. And those patients can present in adulthood, too. They sometimes make it in adulthood, and then they get treated by hepatobiliary surgeons or potentially general surgeons. Um, some of the more rarer things, they also have intrahepatic cysts, and they, they're being treated in liver centers then later. But essentially, colodocal cysts, they're often picked up prenatally nowadays, more so than in the past, when they did reach here in their adulthood. And they present essentially with symptoms of cholangitis or obstructive jaundice. And important for the, for the adult world is, even if they were fixed, uh, not fixed in childhood, um, there's a higher indication of high risk of cholangial carcinoma, carcinoma later. And that happens in young adults. And they present then often to liver centers um, or even to the general surgeon uh, with that. And the etiology, I'll show you a picture on that, um, for the cancer risk is really because of that abnormal junction of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct in those most common um, colodocal cysts. Um, surgical options we, we use for repairing those are open, laparoscopic, hybrid procedures or robotic nowadays. And the principle is fairly straightforward. You remove the extrahepatic dilated colodocal cyst together with the gallbladder. Um, and then hook it up to a ruin while limb with a certain length most people do to prevent um, cholangitis. And some people in the, in, the, in the most recent past have performed hepatic duodenostomies simply because laparoscopically, especially in small patients, that's a more straightforward um, approach and the outcome, at least the, the short or middle term outcome, appears to be good. Generally, the outcome of those cysts which are fixed um, is very good and they may present then um, later with other problems to the adult world, so you have to know kind of about the anatomy. Here you see, what is the laser pointer work? It's the lower one. Thank you. Here you see that abnormal junction, which is thought to be the etiology of those type 1 cysts, where the pancreatic duct and the bile duct essentially have a junction which is very high up, and pancreatic juice refluxes already in fetal life into the bile duct, then causes those cysts, and that's the cancer risk later. And that's why you have to remove this. And this is how one of those looks in an infant. And this is a laparoscopic view where you see the, the, the common bile duct essentially entering the pancreas here, and that's the area where we remove this. And then you hook it up straightforward, just like um, liver surgeons or adult surgeons would do usually with this end-to-side hepatic angiogenostomy with a certain length. And problems later in life, which may present to the general surgeon, any adult general surgeon, may be re mostly related to this limb. And it could be a stricture of the anastomosis here, which can be usually dilated uh, interventionally. Uh, cholangitis, not always are they um, created the same way, those limb limbs. Um, there could be obstruction of this limb, which the genogenostomy can have problems. It can dilate over time. There can be stasis um, or just adhesive bowel obstruction. And those may present to the adult surgeon sometime in life, probably relatively commonly. And this is the hepatic duodenostomy, where it's kind of hard to see on this picture. But the long-term complications are somewhat unknown at this point. There is about 10 to 15 percent incidence of bilious gastritis and probably worsening reflux. And there are not really any long-term studies. Most of them come out of the, the Asian world because they have this problem really commonly, or from India. And they report they actually have a very favorable long-term outcome, but it's a very limited data at this point. And so the incidence of bile duct carcinoma in this, in this approach is cer certainly not zero because there may be still reflux of pancreatic juice into this um, remnant of the bile duct now because of the proximity, essentially, of the two orifices. The type 3 is something we don't usually see in children. We see it here and there. It's pretty rare, but it may present to the adult, in the adult world, and it's called, it's called really a colodocus here. Um, because it's essentially at the origin of the pancreatic and the bile duct. 
And the, the thought process here is there is no cancer risk or lim very little cancer risk. There are just a few case reports in the literature. And that's why recently, most prominently, um, in interventional surgeons or um, gastroenterologists who perform ERCP treat this essentially with just minimal invasively endoscopically by opening this up, draining this, sometimes excising the mucosa in this regard. But that seems to be a satisfactory approach. That's, that's at least what the um, adult gastroenterologists think at this point. There are some case reports of cancer, but they're certainly very limited. Biliary atresia, um, this is a disease of, of neonates. It doesn't really happen in the adult world. It's still a mystery somewhat. Why does biliary atresia occur? But it's important now, or more important to the, the general surgeons also, because some of those patients actually may later present to you nowadays as they survive longer. And if it's, this is untreated, then it, 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 pro, pro, it progresses into uh, liver cirrhosis and then death if you don't perform a surgery or potentially a liver transplant. And it's still, still a, a large portion of liver transplant performed in the US um, below two years. And the reason, I'll tell you a little bit later, the reason of the surgery is not, uh, the surgery is not 100%. Diagnosis is made in young neonates. They have white stool, no bile in the stool, and they look yellow. And it's important to make this diagnosis early because the outcome is thought to be better if you approach this surgically in the first two months. Uh, the procedure we performed for this is after Mario Kazai, who did this kind of coincidentally in the 50s, and then it really reached only the US about 20 to 30 years later, when this was then established at the end of the 70s and, and the 80s. And the principle, again, is fairly straightforward. Um, you have to perform a cholangiogram. That's really the gold standard of diagnosing this problem. Any of the other percutaneous and interventional tests, like a liver biopsy, is not 100%. And then you remove the scar tissue of the scarred bile duct on the outside of the liver and then hook up a ruin Y loop again as a sewer directly onto the liver surface at the portal, portal plate where the bile ducts, the regular bile ducts would come out. And here you see patients with that anatomy. This is a tiny, tiny gallbladder in a, in a patient who has biliotresia. You see already some liver cirrhosis. Cholangiogram can be formed laparoscopically, but it's challenging if the gallbladder is literally one cc of volume. And in bigger gallbladders, it's, it's fairly straightforward. And then we do mobilize the liver for those procedures and bring them out to have a better approach uh, for this tiny, tiny um, resection. We remove the scar tissue on the outside, which includes the remnant pancreatic duct. And then you see here the, the, the dissection, which was completed with the liver surface exposed in that area with the portal vein and the hepatic arteries in this area. And then a sewer essentially is hooked up on here um, it's just a rule limb and an end-to-side approach most of the time. And bile will drip essentially from there into the rule limb. That's the, that's the thought process of the procedure. It can be performed laparoscopically, but has really abandoned in most parts of the world because this is not a 100% operation. You want to do it as good as you can. Um, however, it doesn't always work. And we don't actually know 100% why it doesn't work. The thought process is the disease itself progresses it's also an intrahepatic disease, and that's why it doesn't work in, 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 in some cases. Um, this is the procedure of the past. This is now obsolete, where in about 20% of the cases, the cholangiogram actually shows the gallbladder has contact to the duodenum, but the more proximal bile ducts are, are, are um, scarred. And then the gallbladder was hooked up to this area, but as you can imagine, the disease progresses, and this becomes become scarred and then it doesn't work. So that's not actually performed anymore today, but it was an historic approach. And the outcomes are interesting because overall they have been improving in some countries better than the others. And typical drainage initially, which is really a miracle because in the surgery you often don't see bile at the porta hepatis, but then two days later those babies have green bowel movements. It's amazing. And about two thirds of those patients, maybe more, initially drain and up to 40%, um, depending on the country, become long-term survivors later than 20 years. And that's may, when they may hit the adult world and uh, may encounter you with their appendicitis or something like this. Um, about 50% of those initially drain, then move on to, to get slowly progressing liver cirrhosis and they get transferred in the next five to 10 years, um, essentially. Long-term problems, obviously, as you can imagine, liver disease, um, cholestasis, 
there's some portal hypertension coming together, and then the obstruction of the rule limb, as we talked about in the past. And there's those long-term survivors, it's actually a question, when are they gonna be transplanted? They, they usually do pretty well, but they do have some certain degree of liver disease and cirrhosis. And the question is now, should you prophylactically transplant them or kind of see how they deteriorate over time? Because there have been survivors over six, five or six decades. Kazai, in fact, his first patient was, I think, in the 70s. Those are more esoteric diagnoses, which usually would not reach the adult world without a liver transplant. This PFIC, as you see here, is a disease where essentially bile doesn't excrete it into, into the bile system. Bile's disease has happened to the Amish population around Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and Allergill syndrome where you have all the bile ducts, but they're all very small. And surgeries we perform for those patients uh, on occasion are really for palliative reasons, and they have horrible prurators, they itch because they can't excrete bile, and they have jaundice and xanthomas like this. And what, what is being done is biliary diversion to get rid of part of the bile, so it, it, it's taken out of the anterior hepatic um, system, as well as, or a bypass, a bowel bypass, as we saw one. And the most common operation performed is a piece of jejunum hooked up to the gallbladder to an ostomy. So part of the bile is being collected and it's being taken out of the circulation, and that actually works really well. And that, that can be performed as an internal procedure where you hook up the appendix to the gallbladder or potentially a jejunal interloop to the colon or a piece of colon directly. And that actually is very effective. The question is, does that actually prolong, prolong um, the period for liver transplant? So most of those patients you will not present to the adult world. And this is something really rare. We sometimes see a spontaneous perforation of the external bile system in infants, which then gets really approached similarly to an adult patient who um, has a perforation of the bile system. And, and it's always at the same site, what you see here between the cystic duct and the common bile duct, which is in there. And surgical approaches to this um, include drainage, repair, or potentially then primary or secondary, again, hepatic jejunostomy uh, for chronic strictures which were encountered. So in summary, uh, adult surgeons may encounter some of those patients with those really specialized problems, most commonly the colodocal cyst patients, which really can be fixed most of the time and, and, and do well long term. So it's important to, to communicate in some of those specialized cases with your pediatric surgeon. This is the patient I had with Bill Yotreja. He's now an older brother. And, I mean, he may, he's probably one of those 20 year survivors who then may present with the appendicitis as a 25 year old to, to adult surgeons. Thank you. <laughs>